Over the last few weeks, we've been having conversations about the big things, about the big things uh, that matter uh, in our life and in our life of faith. And we've been having these conversations for, uh, for a reason, not just because, okay, we need to talk about fancy things every now and then, uh, but we've been having these conversations because of this, because the small things in our life can turn into big things. And when that happens, we need the legit big things in our life to be big enough that we want to have a larger view of who God is, a larger view of what God uh, has done for us, of how he loves us, what he's asking us to do, of the way he's engaged in our world. We want to have a picture of God that is bigger than our picture of the world because we want God uh, to provide us the foundation that is larger than the things that life throws at us. So the first week, we talked about why the Bible matters and how God is obsessed with speaking to us. He spoke creation into existence. He, he, he told the world to create itself. In the beginning of John, we also see, uh, it says, uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. Like Jesus revealed as the Word made incarnate of us here. That God throughout time has also called people uh, to specifically share and write their experiences with him and the experiences that God's people have had with them, and that those, uh, those writings are sacred, those writings are um, are things that we can trust. Uh, those writings are inspired by God, given to people, and they're the stories uh, that God's folks have been telling for thousands of years. And so we follow the Bible because we know that it's telling us about the call of God upon our lives and the truths that we can count on. And last week we talked about why theology matters, which sounded at first kind of like a boring idea, but we realized that the way that we think about God shows the type of God that we believe in. And when we've only ever thought about a small idea of God, that we're going to have to go through the woes and the, and the worries of life with a small God, that we want to think deeply and we trust uh, the inspiration. We also trust uh, the experiences of people who've been on this world for longer than us and the things that the church has handed down throughout time that we believe to be true about God. And this week we're talking about why worship matters. And I have to tell you all, this is a, a little fun for me because um, for ages I did not think I would be doing this. I thought that I would be teaching, and I wanted to be a professor of Christian worship. And so like, I spent years just kind of pouring into this uh, and about why, uh, why we worship, how we worship, the history, all those kind of things. But mainly because it's affected my life in a big and a deep way. But also realize that worship is kind of an interesting subject because we kind of have a beginning point and an ending point typically that's pretty close about worship. And I know that some of you might be pretty excited about this today. Some of you might be like, okay, Chad, let's, let's, finish, let's finish this series up. Let's get on to what's next. So I'm asking, we can divide this pretty quickly. Okay, who really, really likes worship? You can raise your hand. Okay, now, now who does not like to sing in front of other people? <laughs> so again, like right there, we kind of like, I don't know, don't make me do that. See, right there, we kind of end up kind of finding this dividing point because for many of us, when we begin thinking about worship, the first and the last thing that we go to is, okay, worship is singing in public. I don't like to do that. Nope. For some of us, like, I would love to do that. I'm really good at it. I'm comfortable with it. But worship is much bigger than just us singing together. But worship is all about us being together. It's a very key uh, piece of that story uh, right there. Worship, like singing, the singing piece is just the first part. And like we've done with all these other conversations the last few weeks, um, there's something bigger going on when we talk about worship. And today what we're going to think about is what is exactly going on in our worship and what's exactly happening through our worship. And we're going to do that with uh, three uh, conversations today. The first one is this, that in worship, we are recognizing the Lord. In worship, we recognize him. Genesis uh, chapter 4, kind of the beginning of, of the whole night. And today, we're going to go like Genesis, we're going to go Psalms, and we're going to go Revelation. And so we're going to kind of, the whole nine yards today. The beginning, the middle, and the end. Uh, but this is what it says. This is a new international version. Adam knew his wife again. And she bore a son and gave him this name Seth. For she said, God has appointed me for another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. And at that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. So at the end of just kind of you know, those, those boring, so-and-so had a son and his name was this, and then his name was this. Like at the, at the, at the 
the end of one of these boring like lineage passages, we find this verse in verse four, uh, 26, and it says, and at that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. When we look in scripture, this is the first instance of worship that's ever talked about. If we look in scripture, the Hebrew word for worship that shows up about 80% of the time in the Old Testament is this word. It's to call upon. To call upon someone also means that you know them, you know who they are, you know what they do, you know what they're capable of, you know what they're good at. You, you know this person. You recognize them, you identify them, and you know how to get their attention. Think about the people that you know, like when you need something very specifically and you call that person to ask them to help you out or to do this because you know this is what this person does. Like you call me and say, hey, Chad, there's an all-you-can-eat catfish buffet. Do you want to shut them down? (laughs) Yes, I'll be there. (laughs) This person we know. This is, this is something completely different from this generic, hey, 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 think, how do you get somebody's attention that you don't know? Hey, yeah, hey, hey. Also, like, I, okay, inside baseball here, you know how everybody thinks pastors are really good at names and faces and all this? You, okay, I'm not. I'm really bad. My dad is fantastic at it. I am not. Like, we all kind of have, like, our secret, like, hey, chief, what's up? Like, I, I just let y'all into a secret right there. I'm sorry. <laughs> but, what, but think about this. If you have a base level relationship with someone, you're going to have a base level of expectations about that person, right? If you really don't know that person, are you going to ask them to do something that's, that's critical or important? Or do you expect that person to be willing to go outside of their ways? for a specific need of yours, and they might just be a really nice person. But that's the thing is this base level relationship, uh, base level interaction is going to lead to a base level relationship. So many times in worship, what we end up doing is we end up hey you in God. And we're doing that not because we don't like him, we don't know his name, but our expectation and our experience with him is at a base level. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. And there's actually a really interesting like, background going on here because this chapter started off with Cain and with Abel. You might be familiar with this story. Two brothers, one gets jealous of the other one, and so one brother kills the other brother. And then God curses Cain, the killer, and, and the curse that he gave him was to wander about, W-A-N-D, and not wander. In the South, we kind of have to make this differentiation. Like to, he, his curse was to roam about endlessly with no center point. And so this lineage chapter, what you see happen then is these descendants of Cain are all, have to, are all attached to the same curse, and they're trying to find a way to create their own center, and they're never successful. And you see the first cities are built to try to create their own center. Uh, warfare is started to create its own center. So in the middle of all of this, at the end of the story, we see at this point in time, people begin to call upon the name of the Lord. So we see that the two lines of humanity, the one without a sinner and the one who's finally realized, you know what, we have a sinner and we might have untied the rope from it, but we need to put that back together now because we recognize fully who this God is and what he's capable of and we need to recognize him to call upon the name of the Lord. But what's also neat, though, is if we look in Scripture, this word has a second meaning, has a different usage meaning, that whenever God calls someone to something in Scripture, it's this exact same word for worship. Isn't that interesting? It's about recognition. Like, that's the, when God recognizes us, and he knows what we're capable of. He knows what we have the ability to do. He knows our deepest uh, joys, our deepest hurts, our deepest pains, and he calls upon us. So to me, in worship, the fact that I matter to the person that I am here for, the reason I'm here, that's big to me. That's important. Think about that. God has called to us, so we reciprocate by calling to him in worship. We're practicing mutual recognition of the other person when we come together. The second thing we do in worship is this. In worship, we're speaking about the goodness of God. Uh, We're going to go to Psalm 22. 
I'm going to read what the psalmist says to us. But Psalm 22, 3 through 5, this is what it says. You, yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. Our ancestor trusted in you, and you rescued them. And they cried out to you, and they called out to you, and were saved. They trusted in you, and were never disgraced. In worship, we're speaking of the greatness of God. It says here, he's enthroned on the praises of Israel. God's enthroned on the praises of his people. That God dwells inside of the worship of his people. That he makes his home in the worship of his people. That in worship, what we speak to is that God being here, and if you've been around Foundry for very long, you know, uh, we kind of go through John 1.14 constantly. The word became flesh and made his home among us. We've seen his glory, the glory of Father's one and only Son. In worship, God provides stability in his presence through his people. And what's interesting is, in this verse, if you go back tonight or today later on, you read Psalm 22, like, it's not a nice thing. Like, it's about crazy stuff going on. Like, it's one of those, like, everything is falling down around me. Where are you? But then right there, kind of once he, the psalmist, like, states his case, (laughs) he starts off with this, but you are enthroned in the praises of Israel, and you have called to us, and we've trusted in you. So where God's presence in worship provides provides stability, it's in contrast to meaningless chaos. Because that's what the rest of the psalm is, is just absolute meaningless chaos. That that God's presence, this is kind of a way to think about it. Um, How many of you, uh, we were talking about with Brian and Kim back there today, um, about the guy who has the beignet food truck here in town. How many of y'all have gone and found him out before, Okay. Or how many of y'all have ever, have you ever ate, ate, ate from a food truck before? Okay. How many of y'all maybe have shopped like at a pop-up shop? You know what those are? Like when somebody kind of like shows up somewhere, we is back there. She's like, I, I know pop-up shops. See, it, in worship, like we say Jesus is here. God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. He's been here long before we were. One of our friends at St. Andrew said before about when they bought this land 20 years ago that we purchased earlier this year, they said we bought that because we knew that Jesus would have a use for it. We just didn't know what it was yet, and we were just waiting to find out what it was. And they said, well, we bought that 20 years ago to save it for y'all to buy it from us. That's why they sold it to us for the exact same price they paid for it 20 years ago. If you know Sterlington Commercial Real Estate, thank you, Jesus, right? (laughs) Yeah, $40,000, not $200,000 an acre. We'll take that. In worship, Jesus is already here. He, he's, he, this is his place. But when the church worships together, it's like there's a food truck or a pop-up shop of the kingdom of God establishes residence for a moment. That the truth of every single thing that's to come at the end of the glory and the beauty and the justice of the kingdom of God, when God's people come together and begin proclaiming who he is, that for a moment the totality of the reign of God is present think about that like that's a lot bigger than sing a song pray a prayer pass the bucket go home isn't it like that's why I'm fascinated with worship is that idea that God's people, and it's not like we sing hard enough or we pray hard enough or if we dance in one foot the right way, he might show up. No, God's here, regardless of that. But when the truth of who he is is proclaimed, that that power reigns among us. It's a completely, completely different thing. It also leads us to the, to the, the last thing, though. Uh, oh, there's... In worship... We're declaring a new story. Robert Jensen, he says this. If there's no universal storyteller, they can be the universe can have no storyline. When we're proclaiming this greatness of God, what we are doing is we're saying, we know the one who's really in charge, and this is what really has been going on, 
this is what's going on right now, and this is what we believe will happen, and each one of us embody the truth of that. Because you know what, where you might, if you've ever felt like that you have an inadequate story <laughs> about the goodness of God, if you've ever felt like you're, you're too incomplete to tell the story, when we're all in here together, I guarantee you there's somebody in this room that can fill those gaps in for you. And that your experience and your life fills in the gaps for somebody else. The beauty of us all being together is that all of our witness to the goodness of God combined can speak to how big he is. That when we come together in worship, we're telling the story of the greatness of God. And last is this, that in worship, we are gathering to speak of a different world. In worship, we're gathering to speak of a different world. Revelation uh, chapter 4, uh, verse 11. This is what it says. You are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and they exist, because you created what you have pleased. See, these aren't just words that we have experienced. They're words for the whole world. All honor, all glory, and all power is yours. We're not going to dive too much into that. We're actually going to do seven weeks on Revelation starting in July. Uh, But all honor, all glory, all power is yours. These are words for the whole world. See, when we gather to speak of a different world, we're not gathering to speak of just our own personal existence. We're gathering to speak of the, the whole story of God. I want, to tell you, I want to tell you a story real quick uh, that I think really kind of hits in on this. Uh, because so many times uh, we think of worship being an individual activity. And I think that maybe one of the missteps that the church has maybe made talking about worship for the last 30 or 40 years is just talking about that individual activity. And if you're a person who doesn't like to sing or is not expressive in public like I am, you begin to feel like you just don't kind of have a place sometimes when worship is going on. It stopped me many times. It's something I've had to struggle to work through. But I had a friend of mine who was at a church when we were in Kentucky that was experiencing just kind of rapid growth. They were having all the same problems that that Foundry has right now. Like, where are we going to put all of these people? And this church kind of had an interesting background, and uh, every Sunday they were having to put more and more chairs out. And there was one space in the sanctuary they would not put chairs. It was about 20 by 20. Because there was about 10 people that would would come there, um, and they like to practice what's called a liturgical dance. Like tambourines and streamers. I've seen it. It looks like square dancing for Jesus. I mean, it's just, it's just, I mean, it's, uh, it's, uh, people really dig it. That's okay. It's cool. I mean, if that's your thing, that's your thing. There's place for everything. But like you had like 500 people in a room, like sitting on each other's laps, literally. Like if you brought your kids into church, like on the lap. Um, and they realized in this 20 by 20 space, they could get like 45 chairs in. And the, the weekend before, they had like 60 people sitting like Indian style on the floor. And the, very, the last thing they had is like, we, we can't do this. We can't, we, we've got to give them their space. This is what these people do. I mean, they're, they're, we, we're going to honor this as much and as long as we can, but the point in time got to where they couldn't. And so my friend and his wife were tasked with being like the meanies to put chairs out. on the. I mean, wouldn't you hate that job? Like, I'm sure if I asked you to do something like that, you'd be kind of mad at me, right? But they, were, they, they were, had to go put the chairs out. <laughs> and they're putting the chairs out where, where, the, where the, the, the liturgical dancers and the streamers and the tambourines. And I think somebody brought, like, a bullhorn one time. Like, that where they did their thing at. And um, they're putting the chairs out, and somebody showed up. And this, this was really sad, though, because they looked at my friend uh, Drew, and they said, but how am I going to worship today? And we heard the story, and I, like when pastors are together, we sometimes kind of tell war stories and try to like out silly each other. And this was during like a war story session. But then we also kind of realized like that was sad because there were some folks that were affected by that a decision that had to be made. But it also, the more and more I thought about it, as a person who thought about worship a lot, I realized like, there's a big truth inside of there, though. 
that we have to realize that in worship there's kind of two things that can be happening. And I'll let you figure out which one you think is more powerful. We can either be a bunch of people, a bunch of individuals in a room together at the same time doing our own thing. Or we can be the gathered body of Christ speaking to the truth of the kingdom of God. So we can either be a bunch of people in a room at the same time, in the same place, doing their own thing. Or we can be the gathered body of Christ proclaiming the truths of his kingdom. And you'll see it's two completely different things. Like for me, what I've learned over years is just a bunch of folks in the room at the same time, you're just scratching a Jesus itch right there. That's all you're doing. But the gathered body of Christ coming together to speak the truths of the kingdom or doing something much bigger, that group's talking about changing the world. And they're talking about a God who's changing the world around them. It can't be a private thing. It can't be an individual thing. It's, it's about God's people stretched out across time doing the things that God's people do. Uh, Revelation chapter 21, possibly my favorite chapter in the entire Bible, but it says this, uh, verse 10, so he took me in the spirit to a great high, holy mount, high mountain and he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Descending. Okay, catch that. Descending. In 22, and I saw no temple in the city, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no need of sun or moon, for the glory of God illuminates the city, and the Lamb is its light. And the nations will walk in that light, and the kings of the world will enter the city in all their glory. You know, our story of worship isn't a story of getting out of here. Notice, I saw the holy city descending. You know, if we talk consistently about a God who comes to our world, a God who makes his home among us, a God, as Eugene Peterson puts it, who neighborhoods among us, our story of worship is a story of God being here in our place with us while we are here. And that's a story for the beginning. That's also a story for the end. That we as a church are not trying to escape this place. We're trying to transform and trying to change this place. God's final and ultimate calling out to his people is, his, is him coming to us permanently and restoring this place. And that world will be wildly different. That world will be very, very different than it is right now. The whole meaningless chaos versus a firm, established truth, that's really going to be fixed one day. Like big fixed. Like not like I fix things. <laughs> like big fixed. See, if our world is in flux, if our world's in, in meaningless chaos, the, the church and its worship provides boundaries, it provides walls, it provides foundations, it provides all these things of truth by the way that we create it in our practice. The way that we serve people, the way that we love, the way that we, uh, we try to fix things and, and handle things, the way that we go out in mission projects, but by the way that we worship, because our worship creates this space of the kingdom. These brief glimpses of the truth and power and beauty of God while we are gathered together. See, we've got a different story than this world. We know the beginning, we know the end of it. And that story is a God who offers himself to us completely. And all he asks us to do is just respond to that. You know, worship is the best defense we have against hopelessness. Because at its most basic, worship is a public declaration of hopefulness. So we become what we worship. What we believe has the most power to rule our lives. We respond to the call God has placed on us by declaring who he has been since time has begun. The reason we all matter in worship is because we together can tell a big story 
about who God is, can look and can dream and can work in a big world that Jesus has offered us. We can declare hope completely. And that's why worship matters to us.